everyone. Darren DeVivo here, and this is Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly podcast about the Beatles, anything and everything about the Beatles, together and solo, and all things Beatles-related. Um, as I said, Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City, and WFUV is a non-commercial public radio station. We broadcast at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2 in the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, online at WFUV.org. We have an app you can download to listen to WFUV. I've been on the air at WFUV for the past 37 years. And joining me here on Things We Said Today are my two good friends, uh, my co-hosts, two more Beatle experts, Ken Michaels, who is a longtime broadcaster who has dedicated virtually his entire 40-year career, which includes time at Sirius XM, hosting Beatles-oriented programs. And uh, in fact, it's been 39 of those years, almost the entire time he's been broadcasting. Ken's been hosting Beatles programming. Currently, Ken hosts a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing and is part of a video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. So how are you, Ken? I am doing well. Thank you, Darren. Hello to everyone, to all of our listeners. And also joining us is the other co-host of Things We Said Today, Alan Kozin, the acclaimed writer, journalist, and music critic who spent nearly 40 years at the New York Times, where he was a classical music critic and manned the Beatles' desk uh, through the decades. Alan has contributed to countless publications, and these days can be seen in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, and many others. Alan has written numerous books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, plus numerous books covering various topics in the classical music genre. How are you, Alan? I'm good, Darren, and hello, everyone, and uh, how are you doing? That's you. Not bad. (laughs) <laughs> and hopefully everyone, thank you, thank you, I'm doing all right. I think we last, when we last spoke, I expected to be without a gallbladder for the next show, I believe. And guess what? I still have it, because damn it, I'm not giving it up. There you um, go. But they're going to take it from me eventually, so uh, more on that on a future show. And Ken has been pushing to actually record uh, things we said today in the operating room uh, while they're sucking it out of me, so... Uh, that doesn't sound right, but anyway. Uh, so we'd I don't have the know most. We'll we'd have that, the most listeners for that. We'd have the probably, most views yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, we could even make it uh, a video cast, like Talk More Talk is. So I think. But so. in any event, enough about my gallbladder. Let's talk about the Beatles. Ken, got some news? I got plenty of news. A lot has happened about the Beatles, last, though. Uh, about them individually and collectively. All right. First of all, Ringo gave a recent video update in which he shared good news and bad news. The good news is that he plans to have another EP out this year in October. The bad news is that there will be no tour this year, although dates originally scheduled for this year are now rescheduled for next year. If you go to Ringo's website, RingoStar.com, you will find the dates for his tour next year, which starts May 31st and ends June 26th. So far, Ringo also said that after the initial batch of copies of his new book, 30 Years of the All-Stars, sold out, new copies will be made available in a few weeks, with proceeds going to benefit his Lotus Foundation. And uh, Ringo's new EP, Zoom In, was released last March 19th with five new songs from Ringo. And we'll be talking about that in detail in just a few moments from now. We'll be reviewing Ringo's new EP. If you need to hear it, all the songs are on YouTube. Zoom In was also released in a limited edition red vinyl. And on Ringo's YouTube page, you can find a 12-minute video on the making of Zoom In, which combines interviews from when he was on Stephen Colbert's show with one he did online with Eric Burton of the Black Pumas. Also, Modern Drummer has posted a 30-minute interview with Ringo on their YouTube page covering the new EP and what he's been doing during the pandemic, plugging the upcoming Beatles Get Back film, and more. Also, Ringo's Zoom In EP actually debuted on Billboard's album charts at number 179. 
As far as the forthcoming box set for the Plastic Arnold Band, we hear that the release date is delayed a week. It's now coming out April the 23rd. But Lennon fans have been given a nice treat with a new video that was made for the song Look At Me. It features previously unreleased 8mm footage of the couple at their home in Weybridge between takes of two of the couple's films, film number five, Smile, and Two Virgins, both of which were filmed by the camera operator, William Waring. It includes shots of the couple at home, as well as John strumming on acoustic guitar. As you've been reporting, the new album of cover versions of songs from Paul's McCartney 3 album called Three Imagined is coming out digitally April 16th, just around the corner, with a physical release including exclusive vinyl editions coming July 23rd. Since our last show, we've learned that there will be a limited edition pink vinyl version available in the U.S. with 2,500 copies made. There will also be a limited edition green vinyl through Target, which costs $49. And now available on YouTube is the new mix of Find My Way from Paul with Beck. Um, a couple of news items regarding Paul and Linda McCartney's Ram album. It's now official that there will be a half-speed mastered vinyl edition for Ram, and it's due out May the 14th. You can pre-order it on recordstoreday.com, youdiscovermusic.com, or shop.paulmccartney.com. In addition, get ready for... Ram On, the 50th anniversary tribute album that's been made by Denny Sywell and Fernando Perdomo with many musicians all covering the songs from Ram, plus the single for Another Day and A Woman Oh Why. On the album will also be the original guitarist on Ram, David Spinoza, and original trumpet player Marvin Stamm. Also featured will be Will Lee, Joey Santiago of the Pixies, Davy Johnstone of Elton John's band, Eric Dover, formerly of Jellyfish, Carney Wilson, and our own personal friends, Glenn Burtnick, John Montagna, both guests on our show, Ken Sharp, and many more. This comes from Cherry Red Records. It's due out May the 12th, and the original album came out May 17th, 1971. Excited about that? Excited would be too much, but um, I, I kind of like the idea of uh, hearing what uh, Denny Sywell has to say about all these tracks now. And, and also David Spinoza. I mean, David Spinoza was there for like two weeks and then had um, some disagreements about scheduling. And, uh, and, and so Hugh McCracken played most of the guitar on the album, but David Spinoza was on a, the, the first few tracks recorded and, and was really good. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear what he has, has to, uh, to offer uh, on the, al the rest of the album tracks, you know? Yeah. And it's a well, good lineup I, I altogether, you know? Yeah. Well, it's not saying that they're on every single track. They may just be on select ones. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. we'll see. Another McCartney project coming, this one in June, is another Linda McCartney cookbook called Linda McCartney's Family Kitchen. Paul and daughters Mary and Stella have come together to celebrate Linda's animal activism and vegetarian legacy with this new release. The front cover says it includes over 90 plant-based recipes to save the planet and nourish the soul. Paul's website says it features family stories and photography alongside some of Linda's Best Love Recipes, reinvented for the modern plant-based cook. It is now available for pre-order on Amazon as a hardcover and on Kindle. It's due out June the 24th. And don't forget, Mary McCartney's been carrying on the family tradition with her own vegetarian cooking TV show on Discovery Plus called Mary McCartney Serves It Up. She also released a vegetarian cookbook in 2015 called At My Table, Vegetarian Feasts, for family and friends. And that's not the only book news concerning Paul McCartney. As we hear, there'll be a follow-up to Paul McCartney's children's book, Hey Grand Dude. It's called Grand Dude's Green Submarine, which continues the adventures of Grand Dude and his grandchildren as they set off on a quest to find their music-loving grandmother, Nan Dude. <laughs> it's described... I heard that. It's described as an action-packed extravaganza of wild wow. imagination 
and fun for the whole family. A read aloud that's perfect for sharing, destined to become a timeless classic. And uh, this will be released by Random House on September the 2nd. And right now is available for pre-order. A few more items. Michael Jackson's daughter, Paris, was photographed for a new fashion campaign for Paul McCartney's daughter, Stella, wearing vegan mushroom leather. Stella Alan McCartney. wears that, don't you, Alan? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, no. <laughs> Not this year. Oh, okay. He's planning on it. <laughs> Stella McCartney tweeted, next-gen musician and eco-activist Paris Jackson wears the future of fashion. We created the world's first-ever garments from this vegan mushroom leather, more realistic, without plastic. And Paris Jackson said, if Stella and the company Bolt Threads can innovate a leather alternative out of mushrooms and not plastic, why wouldn't anyone be for it? I'm overjoyed and utterly grateful to be on the right side of change and to be a part of something so much bigger than myself, saving the animals and the environment one thread at a time. That's another. You know, when, when, it, doesn't, when it doesn't fit anymore, you can cut it up and put it on a pizza. <laughs> it's multi-purpose. Oh. Yeah. Vintage mushrooms. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> and finally, and I hope this does come off happening we have a date here for a beatles festival the fab four music festival this is one that charles rosenay has been doing every year except last year of course that happens in connecticut it's 20 tribute bands from the new york new england area all performing 30 minute sets that day there'll be both indoor and outdoor shows and it also includes exhibits, Beatle dealers and vendors offering memorabilia, records, and souvenirs, plus food trucks, special guests, and more. It's happening July the 10th at Nolan Field, N-O-L-A-N, Field, in Ansonia, Connecticut. And if you need more information about this, and let's just hope that, you know, so many things that we have been wishing for for quite a while will be happening um, as things open up. We'll see. It's fab4musicfestival.com, fab the number four, musicfestival.com. And I will be sharing the MC duties that day with Charles. So I hope it happens and I hope to see you there. Okay. That's Could it wear mushroom I... clothes? Um, if it's not too hot, maybe. Okay. Because <laughs> mushroom clothing breathes, you know. It does. Um, huh? Where is Ansonia, Connecticut? And Sony is actually part of New Haven County. Okay. You want, okay, it's, go ahead. It's, it's north of Derby, if people know where that is. And um, it actually says right here online, it's 12 miles northwest of New Haven. There you go. All right. Thank you very much, Ken. And uh, Ken's News is brought to you by Mushroom. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll get off the mushroom clothing thing now. Hey, they could uh, be a sponsor on this show. Be careful. They could be, but if they were going to be, they're not now. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, we've got actually a bunch of things brewing in our uh, heads for this show and future shows. Uh, we've decided uh, for today's program that we're going to zero in on two new releases. The new Ringo Starr EP, Zoom In, which Ken was talking about a little while ago. And uh, then we'll uh, discuss... The presence of George Harrison on this new collection from Bob Dylan, simply called 1970. I will elaborate a little bit about the 1970 release and George Harrison's presence. And uh, as we've discussed, we've got uh, lots of John Lennon Plastic Ono Band uh, stuff to talk about. Uh, the book, which came out last year, the box set, which is coming in a matter of weeks. And uh, so we've got... Uh, a few things very cool planned for you, including more special guest authors. But as for today, it's all about Zoom In, the new five-song EP from Ringo Starr. And uh, his first EP, uh, at least released commercially. Uh, and then we'll get into the Bob Dylan set, 1970. So I throw it out to, uh, we'll start with Ken. On the surface, general opinions about Zoom In, Ken. 
I think it's a solid five songs. I'm very impressed with this. And, um, you know, when, when you listen to every song and after just a couple of listens, you like all of them, some more than others, you, you're very impressed. And I think Ringo is just taking his time, putting together music that's pleasing to him, songs that he really wants to record, thinks highly of, and doing good jobs with them. I mean, it's five songs. The, this whole idea of putting out EPs, I actually like, because especially if you like these five songs, it makes you hungry for the next batch. <laughs> and uh, as I said earlier, Ringo just said that there'll be a new one in October. So, um, yeah, and, and I also think, apart from the fact that, you know, it's, it's two releases, it also means that Ringo can also get more publicity through two releases he can give interviews when the next one comes out in october so i think it's kind of smart to to do things with these songs trickling out a little bit at a time although in the long run you're still getting an album's worth of material by the end of the mm -hmm. year so um but yeah i'm very impressed with all five of these songs and uh the word that comes to mind every time when i think about this is solid Everything about it, the musicianship, the songs themselves are strong. Ringo sounds great. His vocals sound great. He's got confidence there that I think has been building over the years from, you know, being proud of everything that he's accomplished. And um, I think it shows in the music. Okay. And uh, Alan, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I like it too. Um, there are, I like, I like, as as Ken said, some more than others, uh, and in fact, uh, here's to the nights, and let's see, zoom in, zoom out, and not enough love in the world are the three that I think are the ones that I'll be going back to. Teach me to tango, it's okay. Uh, waiting for the tide um, to turn, it's okay too. But. Um, they didn't really uh, strike me quite as strongly as those other three. I mean, Waiting for the Tide to Turn has a nice sort of reggae feel and Teach Me to Tango is okay. But the Diane Warren song, uh, Here's to the Nights, I mean, we talked about that when it came out uh, as a, I guess, digital single originally. It's got some nice stuff, um, nice Steve Lukather guitar line, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, 10 minute solo or anything, but it's, 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 it's got a nice feel. Robbie Krieger is on zoom in, zoom out. And he, you know, he's talked about how not enough love in the world was sort of a late entry for the EP. It was, was, was written pretty much after Ringo thought he was done and I'm glad he decided to include it. It's a good track and it's, it's a good way to finish the thing. I have kind of mixed feelings about the whole I'm only doing EPs now thing. And I realize that my mixed feelings are totally beside the point because this is the way things are going now. You know, the, the album is apparently dead. And I hate to see that and I hate to say it, but people are mainly streaming things song by song rather than by the album. So I can see how Ringo might feel uh, you know, what's the point of making an album? Why not just make an EP, put out five songs every few months? And, and, and I guess that makes sense. Uh, but I kind of lament the death of the album is really all I'm saying. And that, uh, you know, this being the way of the future is, you know, he's, it, it's, it, it's good I, in a way that Ringo is sort of current enough to be onto that. But, um, I kind of wish it was LPs, well, LPs, CD, LPs, whatever, whatever they are. I wish they were full length albums. Can I comment on what you just said? Sure. <laughs> I agree with everything right there, but it just seems to me that since Ringo's audience is primarily an older audience, they're the types that are going to buy physical copies. Right. They're either going to buy CDs or they're going to buy vinyl. So, you know. The good thing is that he's making this available on both CD and vinyl anyway. He, he, I certainly hope he's not thinking people are only going to stream my music because most of the people who would think to buy Ringo stuff is going to buy the CD or the vinyl anyway. Right. I only like the concept of it coming out a little bit at a time because it leaves you wanting more. 
And it keeps Ringo more in the news because then he can publicize himself more with each EP. Mm -hmm. If um, the media doesn't sort of get tired of that every six months, you know, I mean, they, they, mm. they may feel, uh, yeah, we, we just, we just sort of checked in on Ringo six months ago. Why do we have to do it again? You know, mm. also, you know, I mean, economically, I mean, and, and since, I, I bought the CD and the vinyl version, and neither of them, I don't think, was appreciably less expensive than a full-length album. Um, so if, from an economical point of view, it's not economical at all. It's, um, it's actually a more expensive way to do it from a consumer's point of view. True. But at this point, I'm just grateful that Ringo's putting out anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, when you consider how expensive things could be if you try to collect everything that McCartney's doing, you know, this is relatively much cheaper. Right. Right. He's putting it out in only one color. <laughs> uh -huh. So, Darren? I agree with all of your points. They're all very valid points. I, too, am adjusting to the EP. See, in my case, being at WFUV, which is a radio station that gears itself largely towards a lot of new music and new artists. What I see is that a lot of these newer artists, for lack of a better way of describing them, whether it's a first release or a second release or maybe a fifth release, what tends to happen is they are still doing albums, but they are also peppering their releases with EPs. And I notice that the one thing is when a single comes out, the singles just seem to be happening more today than they were a few years back the singles are almost always digital releases so it's almost like the three formats are sort of co-mingling right now the album i i hesitate to say the album is dead yet and i also hesitate to say that physical formats are dead i don't think they'll ever die and i think the cd will survive but you know definitely when somebody like ringo Starr is putting out eps now that's the clear indication that uh, these tried and true uh, ways of listening to music still exist, the playing field is completely different today. And you just got to be on your toes, you know, when an artist that you like puts out music because it could come at you in any direction. It could come at you as a regular traditional full length album or it could come out as an EP or it may not even come out physical or maybe digital only. But then a year later, it comes out on a physical format. A lot of that's what's going on right now. So Ringo just is just joining, you know, as 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 um, I think you pointed out, Alan, he's he's up to what's going on right now and taking advantage of it. And really, it's the same thing as getting an album. You're getting it now in two parts. I also feel like and this I felt this way for for a long time now that our attention span is short, not the three of us. I mean, just in general. You know, I think people's attention span spans are short and sitting down today to an album is too much of a nuisance. And I think that's also one of the things that plays against the album today. We felt it when CDs came out and artists felt they had to make their albums now CD length, uh, you know, 70, 75 minute long albums, which essentially were all double albums now. Uh, that was a little too much, and I, it's almost like we didn't recover from that. You know, quick, bite-sized pieces is how we like to consume things, which has given rise to the kind of like the reemergence of the EP, if any of that made sense. But um, uh, as for Zoom In, I think it's dynamite. I couldn't help but think of, I believe it's Ringo 2012, the Ringo 2012 album, which is time-wise a very short album mm -hmm. and not all that much longer than zoom in. And I remember thinking a lot of people were criticizing that album at the time because there were covers. There was um, a re-recording of wing R refresh my memory. Did he re-record another world of song on Ringo 2012? He, he recorded also? wings and he also recorded uh, step lightly. Right. Okay. So he redoes a couple of tunes. He adds a couple of covers and he gives us an album that was a roughly 25 minutes long, which is only like, you know, five or six minutes longer than Zoom In is. And yet I really liked Ringo 2012 because I felt like it got to the point. It did what it had to do and it was done. 
and it avoided a lot of filler. It avoided some potential dead spots that could happen on full length albums. Uh, and that's what I feel like would zoom in. It comes in, gets to the point, gives you five solid songs and that's it. And look at the next EP coming in the fall as side two of an album, you know, and there you have it, a new Ringo album in 2021, you know, so it just takes a little bit of an adjustment to kind of change the way you listen here. It's interesting your opinions about the tracks, Alan, because my thoughts on the tracks are the exact opposite. I thought Not Enough Love in the World, which closes the EP, might be the weakest song on the EP. Hmm. I like Here's to the Nights a lot. As I put here in my notes, it's a great sentiment. It's a little corny, but that's okay because it's almost like good corny. <laughs> um, and, and, and really, if you do listen to the lyrics, Ringo mentions that Diane Warren felt this way about the song. Diane Warren wrote it. It is uh, an ideal song to listen to on New Year's Eve. Um, uh, it's, 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 like I said, a tad, a tad bit corny, but, you know, nothing, nothing, you know, that irritating. I, I enjoy it. I really like Zoom In, Zoom Out which uh, makes the, uh, the whole release a timely release with the acknowledgement of Zoom, which, you know, has been basically everyone's life for the past year, uh, use, utilizing Zoom to be in contact. Zoom in, zoom out. I really like Teach Me to Tango, which I thought was a fine vehicle for Ringo the drummer and, yeah, you know, being a rhythmic track. And uh, I also liked Waiting for the Time to Turn a lot, a reggae song from Ringo, where he does a little name dropping, mentions the late Toots Hibbert, mentions Bob Marley, the uh, Bob Marley and the Whale or song Roots Rock Reggae, Burning Spear, he mentions in the lyrics. And I think that's uh, a nice addition to have something that's a change of pace, you know, a reggae tune right in the middle of this thing. And then Not Enough Love in the World, again, I put maybe the weakest track. It's possible the next time I listen uh, to Zoom in, my opinion might change, and I suddenly hear something I didn't hear the first dozen times I listened. You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. All in all, he doesn't reinvent the wheel. I don't think we expect him to. He doesn't put out something that you think, holy smoke, it's Ringo 2 or Goodnight Vienna 2. You know what I mean? Those days, that's not going to happen now. All you really want from Ringo is when he puts out music that it's solid, well-played, well-produced, and it always is. And I think even the production, the execution of the songs is what, you know, holds up as one of the strong, strongest things he's done in a while. You know, the Ringo Burt Sugar production team is really starting to come together, you know, and uh, some of the things that might not have worked sonically on, say, Why Not? Or, uh, I don't know, Why Not always comes to mind, because I felt the production was hit and miss on Why Not. They seem to really be finding their, their uh, you know, their comfort zone, working together and piecing, in this case, a lot of it done virtually, uh, piecing uh, these five songs together. And I'm glad you mentioned Robbie Krieger. I actually forgot Robbie Krieger was playing. I got to go back and listen uh, that Robbie Krieger contributed. So big thumbs up to Zoom In, as Ken said. Uh, it was uh, an enjoyable five songs, roughly 20 minutes. Looking forward to the next EP, which, like I said, will be side two of an album. Can I just say a few more things? Because you said so much there that I found interesting. <laughs> there. And, and, and it's also on cassette, too. And yeah. Yes, I bought, I bought the red vinyl, black vinyl CD, and I have the cassette, which is more so for kind of novelty purposes, collecting purposes. So anyway, go ahead, Ken. Mm. So I just think that most of the, the music that Ringo has done post Mark Hudson is all very, you know, similar in terms yeah. of production. You know, it's all the stuff that he's done with Bruce Sugar it has a very bright sound to it. A lot of punch, very crisp production. You can certainly hear the drums right up front. I love the whole mix. I wouldn't say that, you know, his, production wise, his albums have sounded different since Mark Hudson. I think they all sound very, very similar, but it's all well done. Um, they the do. difference, the difference in Ringo's songs really lies in the songwriters that he's been working with, because he does a lot of different styles of music that he probably wouldn't have done with Mark Hudson. A lot of the stuff with Mark Hudson is very Beatley, not all of it, 
I mean, free drinks was very different. But, you know, I think that when you listen to all the stuff post Mark Hudson, the songwriter that he's writing with may steer the song in the directions that they go in, in terms of the style of it. Um, that's my own personal opinion there. But I really love, like you said, Teach Me to Tango on the new one. <laughs> and that's the one song that Ringo has cited where he was asking people to submit recordings to him that he could just add to in his, in his own studio. And there was a drummer, Blair Sinta, who did almost all the drumming on Teach Me to Tango. And all that Ringo did was one drum fill, enough so that he's brought it up in interviews. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of great percussive stuff going on in the song, especially early on, that I love a lot on Teach Me to Tango, which is really a killer track. If you look at Ringo's credits there on the song, it does say percussion. So I'm kind of thinking that a lot of what you hear at the beginning of that song is him. And also kudos to Sam Hollander, who's someone that Ringo has hooked up with on not just this, but his last album, What's My Name? And he's proven to be a really good songwriter. I mean, Better Days was one of the better songs on What's My Name. But um, talk about someone who is very current and working with the current bands of today. He's worked with Panic at the Disco and uh, One Direction and Fits in the Tantrums and Weezer and uh, you know, bands like that. So I think that that association with Sam Hollander has really paid off. But... Um, not Enough Love in the World is one of my favorite tracks, actually, because it's just so damn catchy. You know, you hear that, that chorus one time, and it stays in your head. And it's one of those songs that I feel like if this was released in the 70s, when Top 40 Radio was playing Ringo, that could be a hit. And Here's to the Nights I like a lot more than when it first came out. More than anything, I like not just the sentiment of what it's saying, but there's also a little bit of sense of humor in the lyrics here's mm -hmm. to the to the nights we won't remember <laughs> you know you you'd think that people would say oh the nights we will remember but it's and it's the friends we won't forget i like that little twist that's put on the lyrics uh, on there and uh, probably my least favorite is the reggae song but i think it's really executed well and tony chen who's uh very well known in the reggae world as a great guitar player who's worked with bob marley is on that song and he even complimented Ringo's drumming on there. And um, even though I'm not a huge reggae lover, I like reggae in small doses. So Ringo has done this on the new EP. He did it with um, Island in the Sun and King of the Kingdom on recent albums. And I like when he's mixing in some reggae with everything else. You know, so overall, like I said, very solid throughout. Um, <laughs> Um, I agree with what you said about the production, and I think what I just feel like, especially with the album, I mean, why not? It's been a little while since I've listened to it, and I don't remember what songs bothered me a bit, but I do know that the last track on the album, Who's Your Daddy, I felt was not mixed well, and there was, you know, there was, it was not one of the stronger tracks uh, sound-wise sonically speaking i felt that way here and there on some other albums those fake sounding horns that are actually keyboards uh you know usually annoy me a little bit and they would be around on some of the other albums and i just feel less of those moments little subtle moments that catch my ear on zoom in so i really do think that you know ringo the producer he never really was a producer until the past decade give or take a few years where well, he was he, taking the heavy. Yeah. He, he co-produced Mark Hudson too. He co-produced, but Mark Hudson was really the heavy there. You could hear it. Mm. And I think in this case, Bruce Sugar is more of a, you know, like a guiding hand and assistant. Uh, I feel, and I feel like it just took maybe a couple of albums to kind of find a sound or find a technique. And that's again, just to, uh, an observation I've made in listening to the last couple of full-length albums and now zoom in that they seem to not have as many of those little moments where I thought, gee, if I was behind the board, I would have brought the vocal down a little bit or perhaps, you know, the keyboard sound a little too much, like, you know, synthesized horns. Maybe I would have done this a little differently. There's less and less of those moments on the recent albums and uh, on, on zoom in. 
and another thing is, I said attention span. Being five songs, you know, I sat down and I basically dissected it on my first couple of listens because it was only five songs. So, you know, I don't know if I would have, uh, I don't know if I would have, you know, I don't know if the sound of the five tracks would have jumped out of me as much if there were 10 or 11 of them uh, and I wasn't listening as intently. Uh, but anyway, so. Maybe we have a, a, a sort of underlying technological improvement behind all of this as well. I mean, Not Enough Love in the World has those keyboard horns that you mentioned, but I thought they sounded a lot more convincing than a lot of ones exactly. that the did. Mm. And also, you know, exactly. keeping in mind that, that this album and well, this EP and the last few albums, um, I think have been recorded mostly in Ringo's home studio. And, you know, the the technology, I mean, you have in your home studio, uh, I'm assuming Ringo has something like Pro Tools, and Pro Tools is the same thing that he would have in a real studio. So, um, so the technology is the same, but the acoustics of the room are going to affect it. And uh, he's obviously in better and better with each release control of what the thing is going to sound like. I mean, this sounds to me like a, a studio production, not like a home recording. Mm. He so does I mean, have Pro Tools. Yeah. He has shown that. Yeah. Yeah, but still, I, I do feel a similarity between, you know, going from why not to today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of like the dynamic range, like I said, it's very bright these recordings yeah. and it could also be that between Ringo and Bruce Sugar how everything is mic'd in the room you know it could be mic'd exactly the same way you know I don't know but uh, I still love the production I think it's it's really executed well mm -hmm. going by what I've seen on Facebook uh, the majority of the Beatles fans both people I know and people I don't know the majority of them are very excited and pleased with zoom in uh so much so that i'm actually a little surprised because i you know there's skeptics are really enjoying this release there's less you know criticism towards you know these new songs as it was on maybe some of the uh, albums like ringo 2012 so generally speaking i think it's safe to say a lot of the beatle folks out there really like zoom in there's still one or two people that are like, you know, but really, you know it, really don't like it. But uh, I, it's, I, I think it's, you know, people, most, most people, most Beatle people are really cl connecting with uh, these five songs. As much as I hate to admit it, there are still some Beatle fans in the world who probably find it difficult to listen to an entire album of Ringo. You know, so for those people, this benefits them. You know, yeah. I, I love Ringo albums. I could listen to 10 songs, 15 songs from Ringo all at once. But the, if you're used to the Beatle format with one Ringo song on an album, a full album for some people it may be too much. So something like this is much easier to take. Definitely. Right. Yeah. You know, we were talking at the beginning about the, you know, the EP becoming uh, more relevant today and uh, the album being either on life support or being dead already, however you want to look at it. Uh, Ringo's actually not the first established veteran old, I, I don't I say with all due respect, oldies act out there uh, embracing the EPs because um, last year, Jefferson Starship released some new music, of, which I was a little surprised about, especially since Paul Kantner uh, has died. And, uh, but they released in 2020 an EP, which now I can't find the name of it. And there was another, I think Cheryl Crow is a, uh, a, big, a big example who came out and said she's not doing any more albums after her current album, Threads. It'll be singles and probably EPs for her, too. Mother of the Sun is the name of the Jefferson Starship EP from last year. Uh, so Ringo's not the only one, but he is one of the few who sees that this might work better for him to do it this way. So, so we adjust and our listening habits change a little, but as can Ringo still making new music and that ultimately is all that matters. 
That's it. And he seems to be getting younger, literally, <laughs> as the years pass. Yeah, that is an interesting effect, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I guess that brings to a close our zooming in to zoom in Ringo's new EP, and uh, look forward to the next one, which Ringo says Ringo said it would be out in October. And uh, now, at the moment, for Ringo, I just sit back and wait for them to uh, do another printing of his All Star Band book because I still didn't get it in the first first draft is not draft first printing is out sold out anyway now we go on sort of to George Harrison but we go into a Bob Dylan direction now with the release of 1970 now correct me if I'm wrong it was last year late last year when a boatload of of unreleased tracks sessions and whatnot from Bob Dylan were released digitally in much the same fashion some years back of the Beatles 1963 recordings that came out digitally, which had had to do with publishing, which I'm sure, Alan, you can elaborate on more. But these Dylan tracks came out, and I guess the response was so overwhelming that they ended up going out of print right away. And then the idea, then the the idea to put them out on a physical album, I think only CD. I don't think vinyl. And the result is this three CD compilation, the umpteenth archival collection out of Bob Dylan's vaults, simply called 1970. Now, Alan, you were going to say uh, regarding the release of these old unreleased tracks? Yeah, uh, in December. I'm not sure that it was digital only in December, but what it was was I think there were only 100 copies of whatever it was available through one store in... I believe England, it might have been France, I'm not sure. It was it was available through one place and it was a a three disc set, if it was discs, from his nineteen seventy sessions basically for what became New Morning. They then soon, pretty soon, decided to release it as a commercial release. Um, as you say, the original one, the 19, the, the, the uh, December release was really just a copyright thing. And if, if you want me to explain uh, again how that works, um, just briefly, the deal was in around um, 2012 or so, the European copyright laws changed. And what they provided for uh, was that if a company did not release a recording that it made and owned within 50 years of the recording session, the rights to the recordings reverted to the artist. They did not become public domain, which is something that everybody thinks. Everyone thinks that, okay, after 50 years, if it's not released, we can now put out a gray market release it's not really the case. The rights re revert to the artist. Dylan took the view early on, uh, starting with what became the 50th anniversary collection, 1962, that he's okay with Sony having the rights to all the unreleased stuff. And so he put out these limited edition um, anniversary things, which put the copyright for all of those previously unreleased tracks back into Sony's uh, pocket, basically. And he has put out one, not every year. He did 62 through about 66 then, or 65. And then he has another bootleg series, well, called the bootleg series, where he also does big archival releases um, and they're much more fancily done with, you know, larger boxes and books and all kinds of stuff. So he basically has two of these series going. One is the 50th anniversary series of which 1970 is the latest release and the first in a few years. And then there is the bootleg series, which is up to God, I think it's now, 15 or 16 volumes, each of which <laughs> is a multiple disc set. And in the case of 19, the 1966 one, if you bought the, the multi-volume set, it was a, a large set, as I recall, they also then sent you uh, digital files for all of his live recordings from 1966 uh, at no extra charge. And, and 
it wasn't announced in advance when you paid for the the set of CDs. You didn't realize that you were going to be getting all the concerts too. It was, I thought, quite a nice little marketing touch. So this uh, 1970 set, one of the unusual things about it is that a couple of bootleg series releases ago, he he did the new morning sessions and uh, other things that were going around, you know, this whole period from Nashville skyline through new morning came out in one of these boxes. And so some of the May 1st, 1970 tracks that George is on already came out in that format and are not here. Um, I think Ken mentioned on a previous show, working on a guru. Um, right. And I had thought at the time you mentioned it, that that was originally from uh, an earlier visit George and Bob made to the studios. But I, I looked in the uh, bootleg series set and the date given for that was May 1st. And it's not in this track list. So uh, if you want to completely reconstruct the May 1st session, you're going to have to go back to that other release, too, and get a few tracks from the May 1st sessions off of that. What we have here uh, are 31 tracks from the May 1st, 1970 session. You'll remember in, in George terms that that was about the time he, you know, he was in New York and he turned up on the Howard Smith show uh, and did, uh, did an interview on, um, I think by then it was already WPLJ. It might still have been ABC FM. So that was what George was doing in town when he did that interview. He was was playing with Dylan on this one session. And it includes 31 tracks. Now, the way they've listed it um, in the booklet is they give, for each of the sessions, they give the personnel list. And on this one, it's just Bob Dylan vocals, guitar, harmonica, and piano, George Harrison, guitar, vocals, Charlie Daniels on bass, and Russ Kunkel on drums. Now, on the George listing, it says guitar and vocals, and then it has, uh, you know, parentheses, and it lists about 10 tracks. Those 10 tracks, I mean, it, it's, it, it makes it a little hard to interpret, but because George is the only electric guitar player on this session, you hear him on a lot more than the 10 tracks in the parentheses. So I'm interpreting the parentheses to refer only to vocals. So it says guitar, comma, vocals, parentheses, and the track numbers. I think those are the tracks on which George sings background vocals with Dylan. But, you know, he's on, if not for you, a couple of takes of that, and you hear the sort of characteristic, you know, do, 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 do guitar figure that he's, he's playing through that. Mama, you've been on my mind. Um, they sing together, I think, on Do Do Run Run and uh, All I Have to Do is Dream. And uh, there are some Dylan Oldies, Gates of Eden, I Threw It All Away. Uh, so... You know, there's they're going through a lot of stuff. Some of it is new, some of it is old, some of it is oldies. There's yesterday, for instance, uh, which George doesn't sing on, and I don't think he does much playing on either. But you know, for the most part, what you're hearing is George as a session guy, um, and it's a little different, as I think the notes point out, from Beatles recordings where. Uh, apart from what we hear in the session tapes, like on the Let It Be sessions, you hear him finding his way uh, through these various songs. Usually on, on the Beatles records, we have the finished version. We've got a solo that he worked out and then played at the session. Here, he's just sort of, you know, comping along with Dylan and Charlie Daniels and Russ Kunkel. And it's a, a much more laid back style of playing than I think we're used to from George in a way. And it also, I think, puts his musicianship in a kind of perspective. You know, he's, he knows what the chords are. He knows what he can, can do, you know, that will suit the song. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of, uh, just sort of interesting to hear him in, in a much more fly on the wall way than we're used to hearing him through finished Beatles recordings. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, really good points there. It, it gives you another another side 
of George Harrison, George Harrison, the side man. And you get to hear him play and play licks and play parts that uh, really you don't otherwise hear. It is a little misleading to package the album as Bob Dylan. And then I think it says on the cover featuring George Harrison or something right. like that. George's name is prominent. And I know it's most of the second disc, not all of it. And uh, maybe the last third or last quarter of the first disc that George plays on. But he is a sideman here. And even as a backing vocalist, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like George singing. Uh, if you didn't know, you know, that George was on the session, you were just listening to these Dylan sessions, you wouldn't know that's George Harrison. No. Uh, in fact, I the first time I listened through the, those tracks, I was looking to see if there was a second vocalist backing vocalists involved and it wasn't it was george and it didn't sound like him so he very much is part of the part of the session and not not anywhere near the spotlight here the session took place as it says may 1st 1970 in new york city at columbia studio uh columbia studios in b and it it, it actually was done at a time when self-portrait was pretty much finished and this was all in the earliest days of compiling stuff for the next album, New Morning. Now, Self-Portrait, of course, was the first Dylan album to get widely criticized. And uh, some people believe that, and maybe Dylan has alluded to the fact that New Morning was a bit of a response to the reaction that Self-Portrait received. Self-Portrait was an album where Dylan did say, I wanted to put something out there to piss people off because... You know, he was, you know, being viewed as a god and he didn't he didn't agree with that view. So let me put something out here that's going to that's going to throw everybody off. And the reaction, I think, was a little I think the reaction was more negative than he thought it would be. And New Morning might have been a response to that, a solid, cohesive Dylan album that, uh, you know, would get good reviews. This was session with George Harrison was at the beginning of that period of beginning to think of the new morning album but it didn't seem to really have much of a purpose the session it, there was only a couple of tracks that they did that made it on to new morning sign on the wind is that the name of it i did that i write this down right sign on the window uh, sign on the window sign on the window i put sign on the wind i lost my ow somewhere if not for you time passes slowly those i think um well, the only tracks that actually were tracks that Dylan then kept working on and recorded and put on New Morning. Everything else is them just kind of screwing around in the studio, covers, digging out old tunes, doing, you know, covers like, like you said, Alan, yesterday and Sam Cooke's Cupid and a couple of Ch uh, Coral Perkins songs, including Matchbox, uh, an old folk tune, Fishing Blues, which I was familiar with from Taj Mahal's version, which came out at maybe just before this session. I think Taj Mahal did it in 69. You know, and again, digging out old things like Rainy Day Women, number 12 and 35, and older Dylan tracks that's going as far back as Song to Woody from the first album. So it just seemed as though they were hanging around and jamming, more so than trying to come up with a lot of substantial stuff for the next, for the next album. And it was just that one day, right, Alan? The George yeah. and Dylan, did they work any more at another time? Um, I don't think so. I think for, for this group of sessions, it was just the one day. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's like if, you buy, if you're approaching this from the stance of a George Harrison slash Beatles fan, a lot of people will probably be disappointed because, like we've said, George is basically the session player. And if you didn't know it, you wouldn't know he's playing on the sessions. Uh, if you're a Dylan fan, I would imagine it's is considered another, you know, gold mine of material. Uh, albeit one of a period that, A, as you pointed out, Alan, has been documented already on uh, volume 10 of the bootleg series, which was another self-portrait, it was called, covering 69 to 71. It's also, you know, that period that may not be the most, you know, the most popular period in Dylan's recording history coming out of the controversial self-portrait album. Ken, any thoughts? Um, agreeing with a lot of what you said, uh, I actually really enjoyed listening to this. And in the very beginning, I actually misunderstood the notes here from what Alan was saying 
Uh, if, if you take a look at the way that it's written, it says guitar vocals. And then after that, in parentheses, gives you the tracks that I believe were the ones that George was on, period, in any capacity. But I really do believe that they really meant those are the ones where he's contributing backing vocals, of which there are nine listed. It is a disappointment only in the sense that if you're if you want to listen to this because you want to hear George sing, you're barely going to hear him. It is true that if you listen to harmonies on this collection, you'd never know that it's George singing with Dylan, with the exception of if you listen real carefully during Your True Love, it sounds like him in the background, even when he's singing alone, because his voice is not when there's harmonies. It's not like it's pushed up in the mix. When you hear a Beatles recording and George is mixed in with John and Paul, you can hear George. When you're listening to this, it, it's not he's not at the same level uh, vocally as Dylan. And, you know, he could be sharing background vocals with some someone else on these recordings. But when you listen to it from the perspective of what is George contributing to these songs, it is an interesting collection. But you have to approach it as though let's just say you're listening to a Beatles recording from Beatles for sale. And you're listening to early takes of those songs and George is working on his guitar solo and it's not perfected yet. This is what he's playing in the moment. And so there's quite a number of guitar solos throughout here that are interesting, but they're just not perfect. It sounds like that kind of playing from George on the fly what would he come up with? This is not like it's the perfect take or close to the perfect take, but it's still very interesting to listen to. So if you're only listening and zeroing in as a Beatle fan or a Harrison fan to Harrison's guitar playing, it is interesting. It's not just the guitar solos. It's what he's playing in the background, because there are times when I will notice like um, at the end of a vocal phrase from Dylan, George will play something like a guitar riff of some kind or a guitar fill, if you want to call it that. And it sounds like George, you know, so listening to it with that angle, going into it that way, I find it really interesting to listen to. And for whatever reason, Mama, You've Been On My Mind is a gem. <laughs> it, was, it was a fantastic recording, the version that George did on early takes. And George does a really nice guitar solo for that particular song. And even, you know, in the very beginning, when I'm listening to these recordings, I'm really not noticing that it's George playing a lot of these licks in the background. But if you spend more time and pay more attention to it, it's interesting. You know, <laughs> it's not just don't just listen for vocals because there you'll be disappointed. But if you listen just for the from the perspective of what is he adding as a guitar player for songs that are probably first takes. What is he going to come up with? It's, it's interesting to listen to in that perspective. I also like to hear different versions and different arrangements of these songs, like hearing It Ain't Me, Babe, slowed down, for example. And I think it's in Matchbox. There's a guitar solo that George plays, which is very similar to what he was doing in 64, with Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. It kind of sounds like that. And you know it's him. So um, to hear him play behind some of Dylan's original songs, I like it from that perspective. You're not going to hear the slide guitar, George. This is like, you know, what George was like in the Beatles on loose takes or early takes of songs. That's how I see it. One well, too many, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I wanted to just say One Too Many Mornings is another one that I love a lot. It's, there's a short guitar solo. But it really works, what George adds to that song. Certain songs, really, you, you, can, you can pinpoint a few that are definite highlights. One Too Many Mornings is one of them. And uh, certainly, Mama, You've Been On My Mind, I'd have to say. Yeah, there's also a solo um, there in I Don't Believe You. She acts as though we've never met. There's a guitar solo in there that I like a lot. So listen carefully. If, if you really want to study George... And just like I said, know that these are early. This is just on the fly. What are you going to come up with on the spur of the moment? All spontaneous. This is what he came up with. I just want to uh, uh, not correct, but mention one thing, though. 
regarding the slide guitar playing. George isn't playing any slide guitar on the tracks that they put on this 1970 album. He's playing slide at that time. And because back in the early 90s and 91, the first three volumes of the bootleg series of Dylan's came out as a box set. So volumes one, two and three were packaged together. And um, that included an alternate take of If Not For You with George on slide, very prominently on slide. I mean, that sounded like George playing. And that's on that set that came out in the early 90s. And if this was a complete collection of that May 1st, 1970 session, uh, they would have had to have included, you know, this, this version with George playing slide on it. And again, that one, you can tell, oh, that's George Harrison. Mm. And you're sure that version with slide is from May 1st as well? May 1st, 1970, yes. It's uh, on the second volume of the three volumes on the bootleg series, volumes one to three, okay. which came out you know, uh, in, in 91. And I remember that because at FUV, we destroyed, destroyed, we tore that box set apart. We played so many of the tracks from that, from that back in the early nineties, because the novelty of this bootleg series concept was new. And so many of the tracks on those three CDs, we played like they were brand new Dylan tracks. And that included, if not for you, of course, I gravitated to it because of Harrison's presence on it. Mm. So, yeah. Alan, there's no overlapping at all with any of these recordings? Um, no, I mean, keep in mind that the whole purpose of the original release of this in December was for copyright purposes. So if it had already been released within 50 years of the sessions, there was no point in it being on this set because this set was just to put things that hadn't been released into Sony's you know, copyright fault. So they continue to have the copyright. So there'd be no reason to repeat things that already were out because they were thinking of it more as a copyright issue than as an album. If they were thinking of it for the you know, bootleg series, they might have looked at it a little differently and, and felt, okay, well, we've already put out a couple of tracks, but why don't we put out the complete May 1st session? As it is now, I think you have to assemble that yourself. Yeah, because there's another version of Time Passes Slowly mm -hmm. that was put out on the bootleg series. So that I guess that has to be a different version then. If it's from the May 1st session, yeah. Mm. Okay. This also plays, if you listen, if you're a Dylan fan, you pick it up and you listen to it from beginning to end, all three CDs. This plays like that, that Beatles 1963 release from some years back where everything's chronological and you're going to get one two three four five different versions of the same song as opposed to maybe some of the bootleg series releases from dylan where they actually kind of massage all the material to make it more of a what's a good way of putting it more of an album listening experience you know what i'm saying you don't necessarily get every take that was recorded during that one day lined up one right after another uh, which is how it sounds and how it plays this 1970 album. Mm -hmm. That made sense. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it says on the so, back, right under the track list, all songs are previously unreleased recordings. Yeah. So they eliminated the stuff from those years, from those months that came out already some years back. They right. eliminated and taken out of the out of running order for 1970. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you do want to explore, again, as Alan pointed out a little while ago, this period of Dylan, uh, not only should you have 1970, but also uh, the 10th volume of the bootleg series, another self-portrait, kind of gives you a little more of a, a completed, complete picture of that, uh, that, that uh, self-portrait, well, first Nashville skyline self-portrait new morning period uh, of Bob's, which I've always found to be very fascinating. I just find the self-portrait album very fascinating because it's just a weird album. And the, the, the one, the album simply called Dylan, which was a Columbia Records release in 73. That was like outtakes of stuff that a lot of Dylan fans didn't really like the initial releases. So Columbia threw, put out the Dylan album. That's part of it also. Well, that was uh, punishment, I believe. 
I think that was yeah, believing. Yeah, he went to asylum, and so Columbia put that out. It's 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 hard to take it as anything other than punishment, given the, the response that yeah. uh, that self portrait got. It's funny that you think of Bob Dylan, you think of Columbia Records, and it's kind of forgotten that there was two albums where Dylan left Columbia, went over to Asylum Records, mm -hmm. and you know I have what are they Planet? What was Planet Waves? And I think the light uh, was it before, before the, the flood. flood. The live album? Yep. I think those are the two. Those are the two that came out on Asylum. And I have Planet Waves on Asylum. And it just looks weird <laughs> to be listening to a Dylan album with an Asylum label spinning on your turntable. <laughs> so anyway, so that basically does it for Bob Dylan's new 1970 album. And uh, that brings us, I guess, to the close of uh, yet another edition of Fang, as we said today. Uh, so... Uh, Let's go over to Ken, get some info, get in touch with Ken, and then to Alan. Ken, first, you. If you would like to get in touch with me directly, you can reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. Don't forget my website is kenmichaelsradio.com with Beatles trivia every single week and your chance to win one of ten great prizes like the McCartney 3 CD or even uh, Wings Over America on CD. One thing that's been developing a lot lately is my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. I've been posting a lot of interviews with people lately, including Billy Amendola, who is a drummer and musician. He was in a band called Mantis back in the late 70s. They got together and reunited a few years ago and made a new album. But he's also the editor at large at Modern Drummer magazine, and uh, he knows so many drummers in the music industry and is uh, friendly with uh, Ringo, even appeared on stage with him at one of his all-star shows. And uh, I did an interview with him. There's an interview with Dave Ghosty Wills from WFDU in New Jersey, who does a great oldie show called the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. And uh, we did uh, a show just talking about Paul's Driving Rain album and why we feel it's an underrated album. And uh, Nashville musician Dylan Seavey, who has been a guest on the Two Legs podcast, just having a very deep conversation about all things Beatles. And um, again, that's Ken Michaels Radio. Check it out. Uh, subscribe to the channel. And one last thing is Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next broadcast of that will be next Monday, which is April the 12th. All the co-hosts, including myself, will be compiling a CD of our 15 favorite Paul McCartney songs of the millennium from 2000 through today. We're all going to pick what are our favorites. And that's going to be on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can watch it live as it's happening and later on our YouTube page. So if you can, subscribe to that as well. And that should cover it. All right, Alan, your turn. Okay. In 30 um, words or less. No <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> That's one word. Okay, yeah. Very you can good. reach me at two Facebook pages, uh, either on Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can reach all of us by email at things we said today radio show. That's all one word at gmail.com. We have a Twitter account, and that is at things we said fab. And we have two Facebook pages as a group. One is just Things We Said Today. The other is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. The shows are posted on both of those. You can also find them at Podbean, on YouTube, iTunes, any place else, Ken? That's it. Okay. Podbean, iTunes, YouTube. Okay. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you. And as for me, if you want to shoot me an email directly just to me so we could talk about Alan and Ken and they don't have to be involved, uh, you can um, email me at Darren DeVivo. Or actually, I recently found out it's only been decades. Uh, D DeVivo works as well at WFUV.org. So that's Darren DeVivo, if you like to spell out my full name, or D DeVivo at WFUV.org. If you want to send me an email, that's D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. I have two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo. You can shoot me a friend request or go over to my other page, which has a cumbersome name, Darren DeVivo, uh, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer, and uh, just click like or follow. Facebook's doing it different now. 
uh, whatever you can click, click it, click everything on the page and we'll be connected somehow. And uh, that's, I guess, it for me as for listening to me on WFEV. You could catch me Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. to midnight. Uh, hopefully soon we'll, we'll be getting back to the full 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. thing. It's been a year now that we've been broadcasting remotely and it's going to continue for a while. But due to the logistics, my show is temporarily trimmed on weeknights to two hours, 10 to midnight. That's in the New York City area at 90.7 FM. And for those of you who still like to dig on to HD, 90.7 FM HD2, stream me anywhere. Stream WFUV anywhere at WFUV.org and on our app. And I'm on Saturday afternoons as well, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, that's where you'll find me on the radio. So I guess that brings us to the close of this show. We will have a special guest for our next show. Who? You have to tune in and find out. Uh, so for Ken Michaels, for Alan Kozen, I uh, hope you enjoyed listening to our review of Ringo's EP Zoom In and the new Bob Dylan archival set 1970, uh, which includes George Harrison. So we'll see you next time on Things We Said Today. Boop, boop.